This lecture is inspired by a book by Elif Batuman called Possessed. What she says, at least I think what she says, is that uh, books not only, um, they don't only enlighten us or accompany us in the evenings or entertain us. They're not just something that is um, sort of uh, a, s a side part of our, our lives, but actually create our lives, or we create our lives because of the books that we read. Uh, and I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting, um, interesting thought. I'd never thought of books that way, that they actually create our lives. So I decided I would uh, think back on my own life and try to remember books where I really had a solid memory of the book and of reading the book and seeing myself reading the book. This is me reading the first book that I recall. Um, I'm sitting looking at this book. It's called Die Fröhlichen Steinzeitkinder. It's a German book, actually a Swedish book, translated into German. I'm looking at the dog Urax. The book says in the, in the cover, it says, Dieses Buch gehört Christopher Dernbaugh, which is my name at the time, although I can tell that I wrote that later. This is, this is a picture of me when I was five. Uh, my first language is English, but I have lived in Germany a number of times. You c I can remember, or you can see my haircut, which I hated. The barber uh, made it asymmetrical. You're supposed to comb it to the side. You can see, and I can remember the scar on my forehead from falling against the radiator, which is behind the table there. And if you look out into the um, courtyard, you can see my downstairs neighbors, Joost and Jutta, who the first time I went out to play with them, uh, jumped on me and pulled my pants down. <laughs> and uh, this is the character Sten from the story. This is the book. My, this is my favorite um, page from the book. Schoenhaar, the uh, horse, has run away and they have gone to find him, they've found him, Urox the dog has found him, they're heading home, and I like this page especially because of the, the hair standing on end. <laughs> a second book that came to mind immediately as I thought back was a book of Austrian sagas. You can see me in bed, my mother reading the book to me, <clears throat> you can see the devil behind uh, my bed, leaning over my bed, because these book, the, a lot of these stories are about outwitting the devil, making a deal with the devil. Uh, the good ones, the ones I liked, were the ones where you outwitted the devil. Uh, the, a lot of them are quite gruesome. I will read a little bit. Tag und Nacht engstigte ihn der fürchterliche Gedanke anstatt in bet schlief, which means that he was so afraid that someone was going to steal his treasure that he slept on the trunk instead of in bed. And that uh, kind of uh, font is called Fraktur, it's old German, and I just learned recently that Hitler, when he came to power, uh, outlawed this because it was too hard to read and it, wouldn't, it would hinder the overtaking of the world that he had in mind. So, but this book, this book was my aunt's. And the other thing that I loved was often it, it uh, the book, the stories dealt with real places in Vienna. Uh, the gruesome, horrible crucifixion is, stands on the outside of the great cathedral, St. Stephen's. I remember the Lord of the Rings paperback Houghton Mifflin editions. They were so fat and like bricks and they were purplish and bluish and pinkish. And suddenly they were the biggest, fattest uh, books. I was amazed that I had read such a wonderful fat book. Uh, it was our Harry Potter. And I also remember painful memories. The first book the most important scene, Gandalf the wizard, 
falls off of a bridge and dies. And my, my neighbor, Brian Miller, casually mentioned to me, as I started the second book, that Gandalf wasn't really dead and destroyed the second book for me. He also did that with uh, Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, told me who did it. Uh, however, when I returned from Germany one year uh, and, and in middle school and was completely lost in math, had no idea what a negative number was, Brian Miller spent many afternoons telling me how to do the math. So all is forgiven with Brian Miller. <laughs> uh, in high school, I remember Miss Kelsey. I was quite short as a freshman. She was very tall, very enormous. And uh, she was very um, dedicated. She was the first person to tell us to think about the structure of a book itself. And she explained to us what omniscient observer was, what first person and third person and second person was, and that even uh, that a book might have several layers of meaning. And I remember she blew my mind. <laughs> and we read The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, um, which is omniscient observer. In college, I don't remember many books, because most of the books were textbooks, of course, so you don't quite have the same um, relationship with the books. I remember we read The Chosen by Chaim Potok, and he came to our school. And um, I remember that very, that, that's about the only uh, book I remember, other than uh, the Selfish Gene, and this is a picture of me reading The Selfish Gene over um, the uh, winter break. As uh, mentioned, I was a biology major, and The Selfish Gene is the, one of the first books of Richard Dawkins, a geneticist and uh, sociobiologist in England, and the entire, the premise of the book is that not only are we, um, do we function based on evolutionary, uh, evolutionary principles in terms of individuals, but our own genes function on that, and our own genes really don't care who, uh, what person our genes are in, they only care, if you can use the word care, about propagating themselves. Um, it's a very careful and uh, logical uh, progression, and it's very reductionist. Um, I read this over the course of the winter break and got extremely depressed because I could not argue with it. I had no way to um, uh, uh, come up with an alternative view, even though it just, the view, because it is so uh, deterministic, really depressed me. This is the cover that still haunts me. <laughs> and uh, the first page, it's hard to describe why, why this could be depressing. But on the very first page, he writes, philosophy and the subjects known as humanities are still taught almost as if Darwin had never lived. Um, I don't know, it was, it was kind of the, uh, arrogance of Richard Dawkins' writing that just put me off. Um, I don't know why. And, uh, well, I mean, that's part of it. So instead of going directly into graduate school in um, biology, which was my plan, I decided to take a year off to think about life and followed a friend of mine to Germany uh, a friend of mine named Bruce who wanted to learn German, and he, uh, my mother found a, a kind of a volunteer position for him, and I tagged along in a different town, and I worked uh, in a institute for handicapped children. And uh, this is Heiko. We, he and I, in the wheelchair, Heiko, he and I actually hitchhiked in this picture. We had hitchhiked to Berlin uh, which was complicated in a wheelchair, as you can imagine. And from that time, I remember taking my friend Bruce to Vienna to meet my 
family, my, my aunts and cousins. And I remember reading New Year's Eve, reading the tin drum in the bathtub and Bruce peeking in because I'd left him with my Tanta Gusti and my Tanta Ilza to have to deal with them. And, uh, and I guess I remember this because it was one of those kind of uh, unif uh, kind of things that uh, bonds you with a friend. We had our, I would, uh, you know, mention little things like um, little poems that appear in the book, Ist die Schwarze Köchin da, ja, ja, ja. So that must be why that stays in my brain. Uh, I came back to the United States not knowing what to do. Bruce's mother suggested I go, go to medical school. I said, okay, I'll try to do that. I lived in a house and I got sick with the flu. Um, I was sick in bed or on the couch for a few days and one of my housemates, Lydie, read um, Henry James' Portrait of a Lady to me in the evenings. So, I mean, you can't really read um, something like the Portrait of a Lady aloud to someone, obviously, without consequences. <laughs> so, after we were married, we, um, <laughs> we uh, joined the Peace Corps, uh, working in an orphanage in Frederickstead St. Croix. So suddenly we were just married. Uh, I did apply to medical school. I was uh, accepted to the University of Michigan. Didn't want to go, of course, so I got this two-year deferment so we could go in the Peace Corps anyway. So suddenly we were newly married and we suddenly had nine children. That's Maria, Elizabeth, Jose, Carmen, Angel, Trevor, Leo, Lee, and Henrique. And those dolls were made by my mother. Uh, she made all those dolls and sent them down to us. So I was supposed, so we were headed back. We stayed down there for, um, let's see, I have to hurry up. We stayed down there for uh, two years. And the summer before, ah, I forgot, we read straight through Graham Greene uh, who's, who, many of whose books are set in the tropics and perhaps The Comedians was the first one, which is set in Haiti, the first one we read, that is, and uh, describes the beauty but also the great uh, sadness and terror so beautifully. And, um, so before going back to, going to medical school, we, I decided we should go visit my family in Vienna, my aunt and other friends. And on the way we stopped uh, at my friend Bruce's house who was now living in Philadelphia. And I said, Bruce, I need something to read. I'm about to travel for six weeks in Europe. And he just kind of leaned around the corner and said, well, read The Razor's Edge by Somerset Maugham. And take, or he suggested it, it was on his bookshelf, a little paperback. So I took that along. And, and uh, The Razor's Edge is um, the story of Larry Durrell. It was written in the 30s, and he becomes interested in, in um, Eastern philosophy, and he kind of throws, throws away his, his life to, as he, say, say lo as he says in the novel, loaf. He'll just loaf in Paris and read and think about Think about uh, think about things, and this this book actually uh, reading about it as I was remembering the book was uh, we, sometimes we think of Somerset Maugham as just kind of a popular writer, but he was very much uh, ahead of his time in his his own interest in Eastern thought. Then we came to New York. I didn't go to medical school. Uh, we came back, I read The Razor's Edge, and on the first day, we came back to Michigan, on the first day of medical school, <clears throat> well, the night before medical school, I stayed up all night fretting, and then on the morning of the first day of medical school, I called up and said I wasn't coming. And that was the beginning of my freelance uh, 
artistic career. Uh, that was the jumping off the cliff. And that jump eventually landed us in New York City. And because of the Graham Greens, I read through Evelyn Waugh. And I, this book came to mind, The Diaries. I'm a little bit sheepish to remember because I remember them vividly for the fact that uh, for some reason Lighty was out of town and I thought it would be a good idea to listen to uh, an opera. I don't remember the opera, but I do remember I drank probably, well, probably just drank one bottle of wine, but still it was enough to uh, make me feel so sick the next day. It's probably cheap wine. And I had planned to go for an enormous walk out to Rockaway Point in Queens. The subway ride to Queens is two hours. And I sat on the subway, read Evelyn Waugh's diaries, and felt really ill. And um, of course, Evelyn Waugh was drunk much of his life, early life. So somehow the two uh, have remained in my memory. And almost finally, I, I uh, read, because I'd been reading so much, so many Engl English folks, I thought I should read Saul Bellow. And I kind of read through Saul Bellow's books and loved Humboldt's Gift the Best. And, and there's a couple, couple of passages I want to read from this book. Then my respected friend Dernwald mentioned kiddingly that the famous but misunderstood Dr. Rudolf Steiner had much to say on the deeper aspects of sleep. Steiner's books, which I began to read lying down, made me want to get up. He argued that between the conception of an act and its execution by the will, there fell a gap of sleep. It might be brief, but it was deep. For one of man's souls was a sleep soul. In this, human beings resembled the plants whose whole existence is sleep. And later, thus went my meditation on the green sofa. Of all the meditative methods recommended in the literature, I liked this new one best. Often I sat at the end of the day remembering everything that had happened. In minute detail, all that had been seen and done and said, I was able to go backward through the day, viewing myself from the back or side, physically no different from anyone else. So I ended the first part with uh, mentioning Rudolf Steiner because I went to a Steiner school for one year when I lived in Germany the second time. And S Rudolf Steiner was a mystic. He was a friend of Madame Blavatsky's. He was kind of a crackpot. He was a visionary. But he was, uh, was a true visionary. His uh, ideas about farming and about uh, education, um, and about building with, he was one of the first people to build with poured concrete, uh, formed concrete. He was really a very interesting man. And I spent one year at a Steiner school, and at that one thing I learned there was the backstitch. And uh, if you don't know the backstitch, I will tell you how the backstitch goes. You take your, well, first you thread your needle. Then you plunge the needle threaded into the fabric from the front. Now you, the needle goes through the fabric. You grab it on the other side of the fabric with your hand. And here comes the mysterious part if you're a 12 year old and your handwork teacher is explaining how you do this. You poke, you kind of poke back from the back, even though you don't see where the needle is. You have no idea where the needle is going to come up. And uh, you're assured that that's what you're supposed to do. So you poke, poke back up, pull it out, and now you go back to where you were before. Plunge back into that same hole. Now the needle has disappeared again. Where will it come up? You have no idea. It's behind the fabric. You can't see what you're doing. Poke it up again and come back. Very mysterious. And uh, you keep going, and eventually you keep making sense of your decisions by going back and looping forward. After a year, you make a lion. 
And one thing about uh, the backstitch is it's very, very strong. And I brought for your consideration my 40-year-old lion. So here's my lion. He has followed me around. And this was actually quite a um, revelation to me as a sixth grader that you could spend one hour a week for a year, every week, and make something, which was unusual to me, which was new. So now very quickly, I want to talk about some of the books that particularly where memory very much played a part in my own work life as a children's book writer. And first of all, if you were counting uh, the books that went by, I said there were going to be 12. Only 11 went by because this is the 12th. This is The Pup Grew Up, illustrated by Vladimir Radunsky. And uh, this is the book that I held in my hands at the original Borders bookstore in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that made me want to be a children's book writer uh, and illustrator. Vladimir has become a friend. I visited him a month ago. He lives in Rome now. This is him, his dog Tsetsa. He's cutting salami. The first book, when I started writing Making Dummies, one of the very first ones was Arlene Sardine. And uh, Arlene Sardine came from memories of Queen Louise home where we uh, got all of our food from donations and once a year a big truck came that had been loaded with things from the United States. And uh, we unloaded the food into the pantry and I was unloading it and there I held in my hand a little can of sardines. And I thought, this can of sardines, this sardine has traveled the world to get to us. So uh, remembering that, I thought of the, um, thought of a text, so you want to be a sardine. I know a little fish who wanted to be a sardine. Her name was Arlene. Started writing and then I thought I'd better do a little research. I wrote to some sardine companies. They sent me things. One company Xeroxed an entire book, The Golden Book of Portuguese Tinned Fish, <laughs> Lisbon, 1938. And in that book, uh, in, those, in my research, I learned that the definition of a sardine is that a sardine is a fish in a can. <laughs> so um, I kept going. I'd already started the book. Uh, I just thought, well, we'll just keep going. I always liked how fish swim one way and then the other way. Um, described how she's caught. And unfortunately, on page 16, here on the deck of the fishing boat, Arlene died. However, Arlene's story is not over because she was put on ice in a box with her friends. Later, she takes a short, salty bath. She smoked delicately. She's delicately smoked. She's packed like sardines. <clears throat> and finally, Arlene was a sardine. A sardine is what Arlene was. Um, this was one of my very first book dummies. And I realized I could never sell this book. Um, <laughs> But as a matter of fact, 10 years later, it was published. And um, some people hated it very much. Some people liked it fine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when doing a book, I generally try to find what is most powerful in my, either for me now or memory. And one of the most frightening times of my Childhood life was not being able to sleep, probably because of the books that my mother was reading me. But um, so I wrote this book about not being able to sleep, and I made myself a little dog, and the moon is invoked as a comforting, um, comforting figure. Uh, I remember walking on Broadway and looking up at all the the um, lit. Uh, windows, and it's a very abstract kind of feeling, and I made the book like this, and then the moon could rise on the left and uh, set, and even come in and kiss the dog when he was sleeping. These are the finished pictures. So when morning comes, the moon will go to bed, 
Now you may stay awake and keep her safe. You'll keep her safe. So very quickly, I did a book called The Purple Balloon, which is about um, a child who knows of uh, his death coming. Uh, and so I based it very much on Heiko, who actually visited us when we lived on St. Croix, came with, a, with an attendant. And we were living at the time in a, in a little house in the, in the rainforest that didn't have glass windows or no doors, no bathroom. And he came for three days and a tropical storm hit us. It was pretty fantastic. And Heiko died just um, a couple of years after he visited us. He was 17 when I first knew him. And this, this became this book in which I made the characters more uh, just anthropomorphized balloons and made it a broader kind of um, story. So the last book I want to show you is based on my <coughs> the very er earliest memory that I have. Over um, the winter holidays, I was just sitting and trying to remember or conjuring up the very, very first memory that I <coughs> possess. And I asked my mother if this was a true memory because I never really asked her about it. But she confirmed that it was true. So I thought, what would happen if I um, just drew this strictly from those remembered images. Uh, so I've made this little, this is a dummy of a po potential book, which I haven't shown to anyone yet. So I will just, it's mostly um, wordless, so I think I will just show it. It's called Holding Hands. All you need to know is this is basically my family. You'll see me, then my father, uh, brother and sister and mother, and it, uh, it's, you know, there's some changes, but it's very much, um, very much true. So it's holding hands. Um, I guess I will conclude that Elif Batuman, uh, as far as I'm concerned, <coughs> excuse me, is correct that books aren't uh, simply uh, sort of part of our lives that we love for and cherish and so forth, but they actually manage to create our lives <coughs> in some way. And I'll finish with just three or two more quick stories. When Arlene S Sardine was published, I was on a little book tour. It started in Seattle, went down the West Coast, we um, stopped at one of the hot pools and I was sitting in the pool and I brought the razor's edge along with me again just to reread it because it had been, it was almost exactly 12 years and I thought I'll read it again. And as I was lying in that delightful water, a pool attendant came by and looked over my shoulder and he said, oh, the razor's edge, I'm reading that book right now. And uh, it's really interesting. I said, yeah, changed my life, I said to him. And uh, finally, I um, was coming home from a, an event, traveling with another author whose name I won't mention because he was at the time going through a terrible time in his life. And the whole way, I was reading Anthony Trollope's Phineas Finn and was completely absorbed, completely happy. And he leaned over to me at one point and he said, oh, I wish I could read. And I said, why, why can't you read? And he said, my life is just too upside down right now. I simply can't read, which I thought was a terrible thing. He can read again now, I will say. So I will finish back with Lighty reading, which I think is a nice place to finish. Thank you all.